Okay, uh, Hans, thanks for the introduction and thanks very much to the Congress Committee for agreeing to uh, let me present this today. Uh, I'm excited to, uh, to present this to you all uh, today. Something I've been thinking about and uh, working on uh, together with other people since I got my PhD last year. And the question is, is how uh, could hip joint rage of motion be related to inguinal related groin pain? Uh, so what I'd like to do today is uh, just present to you the, my ideas on this, uh, the ideas of our group, uh, take you on a journey through the work we've been doing. And uh, I can't emphasize enough it's work in progress, so it's not a, a finished idea. But I got out the lift yesterday when I came to stay in the torch on the 11th floor, looking out at the football stadium. And then I noticed in the foreground, there's actually somebody here going to kick this football really hard. And I thought maybe that's like fate that I get out the lift because I'll be coming back to this quite a lot in the talk today. So it was the first thing I saw when I arrived in the hotel. Um, the stuff I'll present to you today is not um, all my own work. Uh, an enormous debt of thanks to the work of Rob and Igor who were thinking about this subject long before uh, I started thinking about it. I've helped to yeah, give it a bit of a scientific form but a lot of the intellectual property and most of the testing itself has been done by these two Dutch physiotherapists. Uh, and it's been very inspiring to work with them on this project. We're supposed to be talking about the groin, but I'd first just like to, uh, to put it in perspective, think about the shoulder. When I was at med school in, the, in England back in the 90s, I was taught to examine the shoulder range of motion. You should put your elbows to your side and be looking How's your external rotation and how's your internal rotation? This is what I like doing in my spare time. And then you think, what's the shoulder joint actually doing during tennis? And it's not only this. And how do we now examine the shoulders of our athletic population who come to visit us with overhead throwing injuries? And we're looking at the shoulder joint in a more functional manner. So how are the rotations in a more functional position? And some problems with functional range of motion have been described in the, in the shoulder, especially the, the GERD phenomenon. Then we come back to the groin and we think about how are we examining the hip range of motion. This is the way I was taught and this is the way that I still do it. And I'm not suggesting we stop doing it like this but we're thinking about how the hip joint rotates in 90 degrees of flexion. Then we take a look what's happening when we're kicking the football. This is a, a, a biomechanical analysis of a, a very good football player. And we see here the hip joint is extending quite far and only at the end of the motion during the follow through We've got hip joint inflection. So please don't stop doing uh, flexion examination. It's important, and it's also part of kicking a football. But we're not so used to looking at the hip in extension. If we think about the kicking range, of the kicking motion, we've got here some photographs on the right. The preparation, about to step in with the instep motion with the left leg, a large step. And then here, we've got the left arm coming back and the right hip in extension. And this we refer to as the tension arc. So he's building tension from the left arm. I'm dreaming now of your lovely little uh, diagonal thing coming down here across the external obliques, across the front of the pubic bone and coming down into the right leg there. So we're like stretching up an elastic band. And then here, the, the segments are beginning to unwind. So here, things are at full stretch. And then one for one, the trunk, the pelvis, the hip, then the knee, and eventually the foot are going to be activated. And this is a sequential motion, just like the cracking of a whip. You've got heavier proximal segments that pass on that energy to increasingly lighter segments. 
and at the end it results in a brilliantly fast movement to the foot which will kick the ball really hard and at the end again we see hip flexion so once more I'm not telling you today to give up looking at hip flexion what does this look like if you do it well thanks to Nike for making this advert Fernando Torres showing how it should be done But here the instep. Back swing, pre-stretch, and all those segments are gonna unwind. And produce a high ball speed at the end. This is how it looks if you do it well. I think this is probably based roughly around me kicking the ball, except I'm left-footed. But then we see this is the difference between a, a professional player and an amateur player. And we've got here, this is the pre-stretch of an amateur. Very little hip extension, not doing much with that left arm to tension up that elastic band idea. A very different motion. And so we're wondering, could differences in this kinetic, change kinetic chain range of motion have an effect on how people are kicking the ball? Perhaps I postulate, if you've only got this as pre-stretch, how much harder will your muscles have to work to generate force and to generate speed that you end up resulting with a high foot speed? Whereas if you're coming from here, it's a much more fluid, elastic motion than here, a forced motion. So Rob and Igor have been busy developing a test battery, sports-specific range of motion. Here we're looking at hip, and hip extension. You've got the player resting on this foam wedge, trunk rotated, and the hip in extension. Here we see it from the other side of the bed. And this little box here, that's a digital inclinometer that's fixed with two Velcro straps onto a metal ruler that's magnetic. And then you can just press the button there and measure what's the, the maximal attainable hip extension in this position. So trying to recreate that pre-stretch. Again, trunk rotation, hip extension, or the hip flexed. Bring it up, how much abduction do we have? <coughs> Same position, pushing the knee down as far as it will go, adduction. Here again, a rotated trunk. This time the knee is resting on a different foam block to stabilize that internal rotation in extension and external rotation in extension. So we've got five measurements, extension, abduction and adduction, internal and external rotation. Then we need to think, this is an idea. There's a test battery being developed. What are the properties of this test battery? Every time we would propose a new test, you need to think, is the test reliable? What are the normal values in the population being studied? And is it valid? Can we use a test to differentiate between cases or controls? The reliability, they've been busy bees. Dr. Robert's not here today, but this is his old club. ADO The Hague is where uh, I and Hans have been involved with uh, for the last five years and some other professional clubs, all from the highest division in Holland. 83 sets of measurements on different occasions, two observers blinded from each other. Uh, and if we look, if we add up the five different sets of data and call that the total range of motion, uh, then we see it's got uh, uh, more than adequate uh, reliability. So we can say that the test, when measured with the digital inclinometer, 
is reliable uh, within the same observer and between two different observers. What's the normal values? This is the normal data from the 83 measurement sets we've got. 35 degrees of extension, 40 degrees of abduction and 18 degrees of adduction, 31 internal and 65 external rotation. And in total, it's about 190 degrees in a professional football player uh, with a standard deviation of 25. There's no difference between dominant and non-dominant legs if you total that up. Uh, I was a bit surprised at that, but that's, it is what it is. So we've established it's reliable. We've got some normal values for professional players. How about would it differentiate between cases with and without pathology? Long-standing adductor-related groin pain. I've used PERS definition. Again, use it in uh, the papers I've published uh, so far. More than two months of pain at the insertion of the adductors. Uh, you can palpate the pain there, and you can recreate the pain with resisted adduction testing. Got 34 cases, only four of which are professionals with unilateral groin pain. And what we see is a big difference uh, between the injured side, 130 degrees, and the non-injured side, 173 degrees. So the non-injured side is less range of motion than the professional player. I'm curious if this is to do with the difference between amateur and professional or if something else is going on. But certainly a large difference between injured and non-injured side. We're here today to talk about inguinal related groin pain and tomorrow. So we've been going crazy busy getting some patients off the waiting lists uh, for uh, sports hernia <laughs> surgery. 10 data sets, unilateral complaints, all amateurs. And again here, 40 degrees of difference between the injured side range of motion and the non-injured side range of motion. So to round up, thinking about the relationship between functional range of motion and uh, the possibility of this being related to sports groin injury. A functional test battery has been developed. The test battery has been shown to be reliable. We've established normal values for professionals uh, and we've done the first measurements in some groups of cases. As I said at the beginning, it's not a completed work, but we're on the way somewhere. Don't take this to be an explanation for everything. It's one piece of the puzzle. Uh, some players have specific pain related to shooting. Other players have no pain on shooting, but only pain on sprinting. So I don't think we can explain all cases uh, with this idea, but I think maybe one of the pieces of the puzzle might be to do with this. To find out if that's the, the case or not, what do we need? We need more measurements in amateur players. Most of the injuries we see are in amateurs, so we need to know what's normal motion in them. We need a prospective study to know if this is the chicken or the egg. Uh, Rob has already started doing some work looking at how this range of motion measured on the table in your examination room. How does this relate to what you see when these players are kicking? So first measure them just in the, in the clinic and then take them to the biomechanical lab and have them shoot the ball and look at what kind of range of motion they're achieving in the actual, actual functional uh, activity. And ideally, if we get further here, then to start look what happens if we would increase this range of motion, would that result in a better treatment outcome for injured athletes? Thanks once again for your attention.